Heavenly Father, we thank you for your goodness towards us today. We thank you that you have blessed us already. Thank you for the fellowship we have together with you and with one another this morning. Thank you for the encouragement you provide. Thank you for the strength in the inner man. Thank you for the Holy Spirit who moves among us. And Lord, we invite you again to speak to us. We pray for open ears and open hearts ready to receive your word, that it might bear fruit in our lives. We need your word, Lord. We need your words of life, and you are the only one who has words of life. And so we want to open up ourselves towards you to this morning and allow you to speak to us and work in us through the Holy Spirit, your will and your ways. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Please take your seats and let's, um, let's pray and let's ask that the Lord will speak to us personally. What I think the Lord has put on my heart to speak about this morning is titled, In the Hands of God. And um, it's something that the Lord has been teaching me and speaking to me about, so I want to share with you as well. Um, but in the hands of God is, you know, an important and, you know, a wonderful truth that we as believers in Christ and as born again children of, of God, uh, that we see this picture in the, in the scriptures that we can be in the hands of God. Uh, and what a wonderful place to be when you see and when you realize what a blessedness it is to be in that sort of position. Uh, you know, there's many ways that God describes to us this relationship between He and us. But, you know, I think this is such a wonderful one, this, to have this picture that we are in His hands. And what, what that means for us. And I want to go through some, you know, what, what, a, what does that mean? What implications does that have? And what does it actually mean to be in, in His hands? And, um, you know, first of all, where we see, or where, where I saw this, uh, was in Revelation chapter 1. If you can turn with me there and just read a couple of verses. In Revelation 1 where John, uh, the, the disciple who was so close to Jesus when Jesus was on the earth. John being the, the closest, I believe, at, at least you know, physically. And, and uh, you know, we are told that John was the disciple whom Jesus loved. Uh, and we see this, uh, that, you know, in the supper room, that John was the one who leaned his head on the bosom of Jesus. And, you know, he, he, was, he had this closeness to Jesus that maybe the others didn't. Um, and this is John writing the, the revelation that he received from the Lord. And it's him, it's, it's this John who... You know, when he sees the Lord, it's, uh, if we read from verse 12, uh, John's, uh, John writes, he says, I turned to see the voice that was speaking with me, and having turned, I saw seven golden lampstands, and in the middle of the lampstands I saw one like a son of man, clothed with a robe reaching to the feet, and girded across his chest with a golden sash. His head and his hair were white like white wool, like snow, and his eyes were like a flame of fire. His feet were like burnished bronze when it had been made to glow in a furnace, and, in, and his voice was like the sound of many waters. In his right hand he held seven stars, and out of his mouth came a sharp two-edged sword, and his face was like the sun shining in its strength. And he says, When I saw him, I fell at his feet like a dead man. And he placed his right hand on me, saying, Do not be afraid. I am the first and the last, the living one. And I was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. And I have the keys of death and of Hades. Therefore write the things which you have seen, and the things which are, and the things which will take place after these things. As for the mystery of the seven stars which you saw in my right hand and the seven golden lampstands, the seven stars are the angels of the seven churches and the seven lampstands are the seven churches. And just to ponder on that, you know, this is John who knew the Lord so intimately, so closely when Jesus was on earth. 
Yet he sees Jesus in such a different way now. He sees him glorified. And the only thing he can do is fall at his feet like a dead man. And it is this Lord, this glorious Lord, who puts his right hand on him and, and says, Rise up and don't be afraid. It's me. <laughs> and, you know, but, you know, in amongst that we see this written that in his hand, his right hand, he held seven stars. And Jesus tells us what, what that means. He says that those seven stars are the angels of the seven churches. Or another way to translate angels is messengers. And when he writes to the seven churches, he says, write to the angel of this church and that church. So he's writing to people. He's writing to men. He's writing to the messengers in the church. Those who are perhaps leading the church, shepherding the church. But it's a wonderful sight to, to think and to see that Jesus is holding those messengers in his right hand. He's holding them in his hand. And he walks among the lampstands, which are the churches. So we see here a Jesus who is not far off, but a, a Jesus who is near. He walks among his churches. He, he is so close that he knows his churches very personally, very intimately. And especially the messengers through whom he is working in those churches. What does he do? He holds them in his hand. And, you know, we, we also see... Um, in John and chapter 10 uh, that Jesus declares that he is the good shepherd. You know that chapter, right? You know that passage where Jesus says, I am the good shepherd and I laid up my life down for the sheep and my sheep hear my voice and they follow me and I lead them you know, to pastures and all those things. But at, you know, after, after he says that in John 10 verses 27 to 30, he says, my sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me and I give eternal life to them and they will never perish and no one will snatch them out of my hand. So where are his sheep? In his hand. And no one can snatch them out of his hand. So that's you and I, isn't it? Are we the sheep of Jesus? Are we those who hear his voice and know him and he knows us? And are we following him? Well, then, if that's true, then we are in his hands and no one can snatch us from there. And so, I, you know, I, I think and I wonder what a wonderful thing it is to know that I am in the hands of Jesus. And he is there for me and with me all the time. And even... Even better than that, he says, My Father who has given them to me is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of the Father's hand. And I and the Father are one. So we are in his, Jesus' hands. We are in the Father's hands. Is there any better place to be than that? He who is almighty, he who is greater than all, he who is in authority over all, the maker of the heavens and earth, the one who knows all things and can do all things, we're in His hand. He is not a God who is far off. He is not a God who is distant from us. But He's so close to us. And my question is, what does this mean? What does this represent? And I want to uh, share with you some of what the Lord has spoken to me and showed me. And the first thing that this reveals to us is, as I already said, it's closeness. Uh, and in that closeness... The Lord examines us and He sees all. He sees everything about us. He knows and He sees all. And therefore, we see there in, in Revelation that He writes to the churches and what does He do? He writes to them about their true state. And in some cases, those churches themselves or those messengers did not know their true state. He says to some, uh, to, to one in particular, he says, you think you are rich and in need of nothing, yet you are poor and blind and naked. So Jesus has a, a, a clear examination about each church and each person within. And he has a message for, uh, not just for the, the church as a whole, but also for each individual in that church. He says, I know there are some who have kept their garments white 
to one church, right? He knows each individual and he can examine every heart and every thought uh, and every aspect of our lives. So in this nearness to God, he examines all, he sees all, he knows all. And that can sometimes be a daunting thought for us, but it can also be a a wonderful thought, a, a happy thought, knowing that Jesus knows all. He's not careless about us. He is not uh, unaware of what's going on in our lives. He's not unaware of the deepest hurts and pains within our hearts. He's there. He's close. He knows all. Um, yes, but at the same time, it, it, you know, we are told elsewhere, I think in Hebrews, that it's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of a, uh, a holy God uh, who knows all, who examines all, who judges all things righteously. And he knows the motives, he sees the motives and intentions of, uh, of man's hearts. So while, you know, this is a two-edged sword, uh, but nevertheless, in whatever situation we find ourselves in, this is who God is for us. And this is our, uh, the position we are in, in relation to God. We are in His hands. And I think it can bring us so much um, security and and. Uh, peace uh, in the midst of any situation. Uh, he, we see in Hebrews chapter 4 verses 13 it says that there is no creature hidden from his sight but all things are open and laid bare before the eyes of him with whom we have to do. Um, and Psalm 139 uh, it's, a, it's a wonderful little bit of uh, scripture there in Psalm 139 uh, where it says, O Lord, you have searched me and known me. You know when I sit down and when I rise up. You understand my thought from afar. You scrutinize my path and my lying down and are intimately acquainted with all my ways. Even before there is a word on my tongue, Behold, Lord, you know it all. You have enclosed me behind and before and laid your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is too high. I cannot attain to it. The psalmist there knew something that, you know, the Lord is near and he knows all. He examines all things. He searches and he, he sees and, you know, he, you understand my thought from afar. And before even the, the words come on my lips, you know them already. That's how the Lord sees. That's how the Lord knows. And for you and I, who are his children, he is a God who is near. And he is close to us in all situations. He is close to us, close enough to know when there is fear in our hearts. He's close enough to know when there is anxiety in our hearts. He knows when there is frustration. He knows when we are happy and joyful. He knows when we are sad and when we are mourning. He knows when we are, we are desperate, in desperate need. Or He knows when we are in despair. He knows all these things. And so let's not ever imagine that the Lord is unaware of our situation. Isn't that true? He knows all things. He knows my thoughts before they you know, turn into words. Uh, therefore, He knows all things. He knows my heart. And that can be such a comforting thing. Um, and in 2 Chronicles verse, uh, chapter 16, verse 9, it says that the eyes of the Lord move to and fro throughout the earth that he may strongly support those whose hearts are completely his. His eyes move to and fro. He sees. He searches. He seeks. And he strongly supports those whose hearts are his. So the only condition there is that my heart must be totally his. And the rest God will take care of. He will strongly support me. If I am that sheep of Jesus following him hearing His voice and following Him and obeying Him, then He is for me to support me. And so the first thing is closeness and that He examines, He sees all things. And secondly, you know, 
uh, when, when we see that we are in the Lord's hands. You know, when you hold something in your hand, usually it's because you, you care about that thing. You know, when you have a precious jewel or a precious pearl or something of great price, what do you do? You hold it in your hands. You hold it uh, tightly. You, you don't want to drop it. And, uh, you know, even, even more than that, what's precious in our lives? Our children. We hold them in our hands, don't we? Because we love them, because we want to keep them close, because we care for them. And so we see this picture of the Lord as well. He, he holds us in His hand because He cares for us. If He wouldn't care for us, he, we wouldn't be in His hand. He would throw us away. He would cast us away, but He doesn't. He holds us in His hands. And even in those churches in Revelation, some of those churches had, He had so, such uh, you know, uh, bad things to say about them. But nevertheless, they were in His hand. And He was there. He was near. He was calling them to repentance. But He wasn't casting them away just yet. He was speaking to them because He wanted them to turn back and to correct things in their lives that He might continue to hold them there and care for them and provide for them. And, you know, this is how He cares for us. And, you know, we see in Psalm 23 that David knew something of this. That as Jesus declared in John chapter 10, well, we know now that Jesus is the Good Shepherd, but David knew this centuries ago. He knew the Lord as his shepherd. And we know that psalm so well. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. Why? Because he's the one who leads me in green pastures. He's the one who takes me beside quiet waters so I can drink. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness. He does everything I need. For, you know, he provides for all my needs. He cares for me. That I don't lack anything because He's my shepherd and I'm His sheep. And even when I go through difficult times, when I go through the valley of the shadow of death, I'm not alone there. He's there with me. His rod and His staff comfort me. He shows me the way to navigate through. He leads me out of those things and He leads me where? To a place where He's laid a table before me and He has filled my cup to overflow. He anoints my head with oil. And David says, you know, I, I, surely uh, goodness and loving kindness will follow me all my days. And where do I want to dwell? With the Lord, in the house of the Lord. That's where I want to be. Is that our desire as well? I want to make it my desire more and more. And even when you go astray, you know what happens when a sheep goes astray? What does the shepherd do? Ah, good riddance. That bad sheep, you know, always goes astray. Better off without that, that sheep, aren't I? No, he doesn't say that. The good shepherd says, I've lost a sheep. Where is he? Where is she? I want to go look for, for them. And he leaves 99 to go search for the one. Why? Because he loves that sheep. Because he cares for that sheep. And so you and I, when we go astray, does the Lord cast us off? Does he forget about us? Does He leave us to the wolves? No, He doesn't. He searches for us. And when He finds us, and He surely will find us, because we saw that He knows all things, doesn't He? His eyes move to and fro across the earth. So He knows where His sheep is at. And what does He do? He personally goes and He picks up that sheep and lays it on His shoulders and brings it back. And what happens then? Rejoicing. There's a feast. There's a party. Because he has found the sheep that was lost. And all of heaven rejoices with him, doesn't it? We are told the angels in heaven rejoice. So we are very valuable to Jesus. We see that. We see that from God's word. Can we believe it? Well, we have to exercise faith there, don't we? Because when the circumstances don't seem to reveal that to us, we have to... Trust our shepherd and know that he is near in spite of circumstances, in spite of what's going on around us. And you know, Israel went astray many times, didn't it? It's all written down for us. 
Man, if our lives were written down in a book just like the life of Israel was written down, how many times would we have gone astray in our lives? How many times would the Lord have to rebuke us and send something our way to remind us to turn back to the Lord? But, you know, we see in Ezekiel that uh, it was a time when Israel was very backslidden and, you know, very, very fallen from, uh, from the Lord. Uh, and they had gone astray. And in, in the time of Ezekiel, you know, the Lord had to re rebuke and say many harsh things to Israel. And he examined them again and he revealed what is the true state of the people of Israel and more so the leaders of Israel. He saw what was done in secret and in hiding, how they worshipped other idols. And yet, um, you know, he, in the midst of all this, this terrible situation, the Good Shepherd, we see the Good Shepherd once again. We see in Ezekiel chapter 34, verses 11 and 12, For thus says the Lord God, Behold, I myself will search for my sheep and seek them out as a shepherd cares for his herd in the day when he is among, among his scattered sheep. So I will care for my sheep and will deliver them from all the places which they were scattered on a cloudy and gloomy day. He says, I myself. And he had many things to say against the, the shepherds of Israel, the men who were leaders in Israel, because they were supposed to be little shepherds for Israel. Uh, and he had, he had a lot of bad things to say about them. But he says, though your shepherds have failed, I myself, the good shepherd, I will come and seek out my sheep. And I will bring them back, those who have been scattered in a dark and gloomy day. And he goes on to say, verse 15, I will feed my flock and I will lead them to rest, declares the Lord God. I will seek the lost, bring back the scattered, bind up the broken, and strengthen the sick. This is the shepherd. This is the good shepherd. Even when we go astray, when it is our fault that we are in a bad state, when we have made bad decisions, when we have made bad choices and we should have known better, what happens then? Does the Lord cast us off? No. Even then He has words of kindness and compassion towards us just as he had for Israel and you know when we see that the Lord cares for us and he holds us in his hand it means that you can rest just as he said here in Ezekiel I will feed my flock and lead them to rest and for you and I, what does that mean? When, well, when we are in a difficult situation, whether we have brought ourselves in that bit, bad situation or not, or something has come our way to test us, we can rest and we can allow Him to be in control of any situation. And you and I both know that anxieties can come our way so many times, right? and fears and worries. Um, but we need to learn to cast those anxieties on Him. He doesn't want us to be anxious, does He? He doesn't want us to be worried, does He? In fact, He speaks about these very things. Uh, and, you know, just to show you one, in 1 Peter 5, verses 6 and 7, it says, Humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God, that He might exalt you at the proper time casting all your anxieties on Him because He cares for you. So if we learn to humble ourselves under His mighty hand, whenever anxieties come, whenever fears come, what should we do? Try and work out a plan how to overcome the situation we're in, how to get ourselves out of that situation? Well, you can do that. Or you have another option, to cast your anxiety upon Him. Humble yourself under His mighty hand and cast your anxieties upon Him. Let Him take care of it. Let Him be in control. Because He cares for you. Not because He, he has this complexion where He wants to be in control all the time. Because He's got a controlling, you know, attitude towards us. 
No, because He cares for us. And He wants to take care of us. He wants to take care of things for us. He invites us to cast our anxieties upon Him. Because He cares for us. So we have two choices. Which is the better choice? Intellectually, we might know which is the better choice. What about experientially? Yeah, I've failed many times. As I'm sure you probably have too. But I want to learn. And the Lord's been teaching me. The Lord's been teaching me how to cast my anxieties upon Him. And whenever anxiety comes, how long do I allow that anxiety in my heart? How long? Days? Weeks? Months? Now I've, I've got to learn to do it quickly. To get rid of it quickly. To cast it on Him quickly. Because His hand is mighty. And I want to humble myself under His mighty hand. He'll lift me up at the right time. He'll work out the situation at the right time. He doesn't promise immediate results. But He does promise to give us rest. He does promise to give us peace, doesn't He? And it says in uh, Philippians 4, Be anxious for nothing. But what should I do then, Lord? Bring your supplications and prayers before Him with thanksgiving. And what's His, his part? His peace, which surpasses understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Is that a promise or what? A promise and a commandment. Bring your supplications before Him with thanksgiving. Don't forget to give thanks. Why? Because He's in control and He cares for us. But when we do our part, He does His part. He may not work things out immediately like we want them. Oh, I've got this financial need. Lord, put that money in my bank account straight away, please. No. You've got to let go. And you've got to trust Him. You've got to allow the, le the shepherd to work things out. Because He's got the best timing. He knows all things. He knows everything that goes on. And he can bring, uh, you know, he can resolve the situation at the right time. And he, he has done so for me so many times at the right time. We just got to be patient and we got to learn to leave it to God. And then he'll work things out. But he promises rest. And even when it comes to judgment and discipline, even then the Lord is merciful. When we've made bad decisions... Uh, we've done things wrong when we shouldn't have. Even in that, the Lord is merciful. And what does He do? He relents concerning calamity. A number of times I found in the Bible, especially in the Old Testament, where God brought judgment in a situation. He had to. When things get so bad, when people forsake Him, when they turn to idols, when they go astray, God brings judgment. But the purpose of that judgment is to bring them back. And still He gives opportunity. Before judgment comes, He gives warning, prior warning. Just as He did with Nineveh, didn't He? He sent Jonah there to warn them, hey, calamity is coming. And He gave them opportunity to repent. And He does so even with you and I, doesn't He? He doesn't discipline immediately. He doesn't correct immediately. Uh, it says in Romans 3 that His kindness leads us to repentance. God prefers through kindness to lead us to repentance. But even so, even if His kindness and patience doesn't lead us there, He's got other tools to do it. Right? But they're not the priority. They're not the, the first um, thing that He uses. But even then, even when He has to use some discipline or He has to bring some judgment... To wake us up. Even then, the Lord is merciful. And I remembered the situation with David where David, it says in um, 1 Chronicles chapter 21, it says that Satan was against Israel. He rose up against Israel. And he put it in David's heart to number Israel, to number the, you know, the, the men who are able to, uh, you know, to fight and to go to war. And David gave in to that temptation. And David, in spite of, you know, he told his, uh, his advisor, I think it was Joab, you know, go out and number the people. I want to know how many we have. How many, you know, men we have and how strong we are, how big we are compared to the other nations around us. 
And Joab said, no, don't do this thing, my Lord. May Israel grow a thousand times, but don't do this. The Lord is the one who, who is our strength, not numbers. And even so, David went on, he told him, he commanded him. And Joab went and counted. And he came back and gave the report. And shortly after, the Lord rebuked David. And he came to him in judgment. Uh, because David had opportunity to change his mind, to repent, but he didn't. And so the Lord comes, 1 Chronicles 21, verse 9 to 15. And I think you know this as well, but it says the Lord spoke to Gad, David's seer, and he came to David and said, uh, he says, go to David and say, thus says the Lord, I offer you three things. Choose for yourself one of them, which I will do to you. Isn't that good of God also? He gives you a choice. Three punishments. Choose one. How many have, have you uh, have done that with their children? I, don't, I, I haven't. <laughs> Maybe sometimes I gave them two choices. But, uh, yeah. God still, you know, I see His mercy and His goodness there. He says, I give you three things. Pick one. And David was wise. He was wise. I like David's answer here. Um, so God says to him, take for yourself either three years of famine or three months to be swept away before your foes while the sword of your enemies overtakes you or else three days of the sword of the Lord, even pestilence in the land and the angel of the Lord destroying throughout all the territory. Now, therefore, consider what answer I shall return to him who sent me. And David says this. He says to Gad, I am a gray, in great distress. But he says, please let me fall into the hand of the Lord, for his mercies are very great. But do not let me fall into the hand of man. Wasn't David wise there? Didn't he know the Lord there in that answer? He says, let me fall into the hand of the Lord. It's much better to fall into the hand of the Lord than into the hand of men, isn't it? Why? What's the difference? Men are weaker. God is stronger. Why would you want to fall into God's hands? He can do more harm than anyone, any man can do, right? Well, that's not what David was thinking. He said, let me fall into God's hands because I know that He is merciful. Even in judgment, even in calamity, God is merciful. And He relents concerning these things. Whereas man, oh... No, man's not so quick to turn from such things. They're not merciful like God is. They're not kind. They're not caring like God is. And so the Lord sent a pestilence on Israel. 70,000 men of Israel fell. And God sends an angel to Jerusalem to destroy it. But as he was about to destroy it, the Lord saw and was sorry over the calamity. And he said to the destroying angel, it's enough. Now relax your hand. God could have done much more to Israel because of David. But God looked and saw and he felt sorry. God is merciful even in judgment. So, even when I've done something wrong, I want to learn to say, Lord, I fall in your hands. Don't let me fall in the hands of men. Yeah, I've stuffed things up. And now I have to pay for it. You know, in terms of earthly things and men whom I've wronged, people I've wronged. But Lord, I want to fall into your hands. You deal with me. Don't let man deal with me. Well, we've got to learn these things. How did David learn it? He learned it through situations. He learned it through trials. He didn't become king in one day, did he? No, he had to run for his life for years and years until he became king. He received a promise, yet it took years before he became king and before he could give this command to number the people. How did he know that God was merciful? How did he know that it's better for him to fall into the hands of God than into the hands of men? Because he knew God through the experiences. 
and the difficulties he had already faced so many times. So that's how God cares for us when we are in his hand, when we are in the palm of his hand. He cares for us. He will provide for us. He will help us. He will grant us peace. Um, And he'll do so many things for us because he cares for us. And even when he's got to correct us and punish us and discipline us, he will do it with a caring heart because he loves us. That's what Hebrews 12 tells us, that he deals with us as with sons. And he corrects us in order to, not in order to destroy us, but in order to, that we might partake of his holiness. And it's a proof that he loves us when he disciplines us. So praise the Lord. Thirdly, it's a protection for us. When we are in God's hands, it's a protection for us. Just as Jesus declared, my sheep, no one is going to snatch them from my hand because he protects us. He is our refuge. He is our rock. Uh, And in him we can always hide and receive protection. And he is our security. We can be safe and secure. Uh, I like that song that says, leaning, leaning, leaning on the everlasting arms. Safe and secure from all alarms. Well, that's what our experience should be. And David learned how to trust in the Lord and take refuge in him when he was being hunted by Saul so many years. He was hunted down and he had to hide in caves and run and hide and move in the darkness of night, not in the day, sometimes. And this is what David has to say through the Psalms. So many times he says this thing. He says in Psalm 11 verse 1, In the Lord I take refuge. In Psalm 16 verse 1, Preserve me, O God, for I take refuge in you. Psalm 17 verse 6 and 7, I have called upon you, for you will answer me, O God. Incline my ear to me, hear my speech. Wondrously show your loving kindness, O Saviour, of those who take refuge at your right hand, for those who rise up against them. Psalm 18, verse 2. The Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer, my God, my rock in whom I take refuge, my shield and the horn of my salvation, my stronghold. And again in Psalm 18, verse 30. He is a shield to all who take refuge in him. Can you and I take refuge in him just like David did? Can we? Is it a possibility for us? It is. Is there anything hindering us? It's only our unbelief that hinders us. God has made a way for us to come into the holy place, to have fellowship with Him, where we take refuge in Him. And He's our protection. He's our security. So let us learn like David. And, you know, it's not something you learn overnight, but it's something we can learn through the trials, through the difficulties of life, Where do we run for refuge? Where is our refuge? Is it our bank account? When we have lots in there? Is that our refuge? I think it says somewhere in Proverbs that to the rich man, his riches, his wealth are like a a strong tower for him or or like a fortified city for him. But only in his mind. Because riches cannot deliver Riches cannot protect you. They can't help you in the day of of trouble or in the day of need. It's only in your mind that you run to money for help as a refuge, as as a rock to stand on. You can't stand on money. And you can't lean on men. You can't trust in man. It says somewhere that Cursed is the man who leans on the arm of the flesh. Cursed is the man who leans on the arm of the flesh. But blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord and makes the Lord his boast. So only in him can we have security. And fourthly, to be in his right hand means power and strength. You know, it says there clearly, it's his right hand. He holds us in his right hand, right? Why the right? Why not the left? Is his uh, left hand any weaker? 
No, I don't think so. Um, you know, but for us, our leading hand, usually, you know, I'm sorry if you're left-handed, but our right hand is the hand of strength and skill, isn't it? When we want to hold something securely, we hold it in our right hand. That's the leading hand. When we want to throw a hammer, you know, hit a, hit a nail with a hammer, we hold it in our leading hand, our right hand, because it has skill, it has precision, it has the ability, and it has, usually, it has the greatest strength also. And so, you know, God tells us, you know, we are in His right hand, not just any hand. And that's important, an important detail as well, because in His right hand is strength and might. And, you know, we, we see that God told the people of Israel um, that when they would enter the land, this is in Deuteronomy chapter 26, and Moses is speaking to the, to the people on, on God's behalf, and God tells Moses to tell the people that when they enter the land that He has promised them, and they settle in the land that they are to bring an offering to the Lord of first fruits, the first fruits of the land, uh, and bring it before the Lord as, as an offering and as a thanksgiving to God. And God says they are to say this, and in amongst other things, He says they are to say in verse 8, The Lord brought us out of Egypt with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm. So what brought deliverance for Israel from the bondage of Egypt? The mighty hand of God, the mighty arm, the outstretched arm of God. And so when we look at His hand, we see strength, we see power, we see might. And whenever we are lacking strength, whenever our heart fails us, you know, we're not talking about physical strength here. We're talking about a different kind of strength. You know, in those days, they needed a physical deliverance. Do we need a physical deliverance these days? I don't think so. We, we have it quite easy, quite well. Yes, we have sicknesses and God needs to heal us physically. But the greater things for us are the spiritual things. The things of the heart that He needs to heal. And we cannot do it in our own strength. We cannot overcome those things in our strength. We cannot overcome lust in our strength. We can't overcome a lying tongue in our strength. We can't overcome anger and anxiety and fear and so many things that plague our hearts. Who can overcome them? The mighty hand of the Lord can. And so we can appeal to Him for strength in those times of need. We are told to go to the throne of grace, aren't we? To find strength, uh, help in time of need. Because the hand of God is almighty and he can do all things. And David himself was a good fighter. We see that, you know, he slayed lions and bears before he became a, a soldier, before he took up a sword. But even after that, you know, he, he was a good fighter and he had the reputation of slaying Goliath with a stone. And so... If anyone could be tempted to trust in themselves, in their own strength, it was David. Everyone knew he slayed Goliath, the biggest man they ever seen. And, you know, he, he had this reputation after him that Saul slayed, what, thousands? And David slayed ten thousands, something like that. And he also had mighty men, a group of mighty men with him. These mighty men who were warriors. And it says that they slayed giants even. And they overcame even the Philistines with a small group of mighty men. All of Israel fled from the scene in one situation. And it was just David and his mighty men. Possibly 300, I think. I don't know. But there was a smaller group even still. I think the 30 mighty men they were called. And they stood against the Philistine army. And they had victory. And we are told of some of the things they did, some awesome things they did. But this is David who could trust in the arm of the flesh and he chose not to. He chose not to. Uh, he says in Psalm 20 verses 6 and 7, I know the Lord saves His anointed. 
and he will answer him from his holy heaven with the saving strength of his right hand. Some boast in chariots and some in horses, but we will boast in the name of the Lord our God. And in Psalm 18, verse 31 and 2, For who is God but the Lord, and who is a rock except our God, the God who girds me with strength? And verse 34, He trains my hands for battle, so that my arms can bend a bow of bronze. David always acknowledged God. It was God's strength that kept him, that helped him, that enabled him. Can we too learn like David to say, it's the mighty right hand of the Lord that gives me strength. It's not me. It's not my willpower, not my intellectual ability, not my own wisdom that gets me out of trouble, that delivers me. It's the mighty hand of the Lord. And may we learn to always acknowledge him and always run to him and trust in him. Others boast in chariots and things like that and horses, don't they? Others boast in their money and their mansions and their wealth. Others boast in their health because they have such a healthy lifestyle and they exercise and do so many things. Yeah, you can trust in so many things. But at the end of it, who is really the one who sustains us? Who is the one who gives us life? Who is the one who can take away our health in an instant? Who is the one who can cause our riches to melt and disappear like a vapor? But he is the one who is strong. And you know, David himself wasn't just talking about physical strength here. Um, in Psalm 138 and verse 3, he says, On the day I called, you answered me, and you made me bold with strength in my soul. So David knew that he was the strength of his soul also. God was his strength, even inwardly, not just outwardly. He said, yeah, you give me strength, you train my hands for war, and I can bend a bow of bronze, but you're the strength of my soul also, my heart. When my heart fails, when David's heart was failing, it says that he encouraged himself in the Lord. Didn't encourage himself in his mighty men because he had someone with him. Didn't encourage himself with his reputation and his past achievements. He says, it says he encouraged himself in the Lord. He is our encouragement and he is the one who gives us strength inwardly and outwardly. And I, I'm learning what, to do what it says in Psalm 73. And I think you know this this verse also, but in Psalm 73, verses 25 and 26, it's a psalm of Asaph. Whom have I in heaven but you? And besides you I desire nothing on earth. My flesh and my heart may fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. So, are we going to lean on ourselves when we're in need? Are we going to lean on our own strength? Or are we going to say and declare, like a psalmist Asaph, God is the strength of my heart. When my flesh fails and my heart fails, God is my strength. And Proverbs 3 verse 5 says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart and don't lean on your own understanding. What a wonderful concept for us to learn and to practice. It's all good if it's in, in your mind, but it doesn't help you much if it's just in your mind, just a memory verse until it becomes practical in our lives. When we trust in the Lord, when we acknowledge Him in all our ways, He makes our path straight, and we don't lean on our own understanding, but we trust in Him always. He's our strength. And finally, you know, there are other things. You know, God is a God of provision. But finally, I want to look at authority, that God is in authority, in ultimate authority above all. And this is so important for us to remember because perhaps at times we forget who's in charge of this universe. And we are told in the scriptures that there is a God of this world. You know who he is? Who's in charge of this world? Me? <laughs> no. <laughs> Any man? No. Not the president, not the prime minister. It's Satan. He's the God of this world. And so he has some rule and authority here on earth in this world over those who are submitted to him. And maybe sometimes we too 
uh, fall to this thought that, oh, Satan is in charge of this world and he's ruining my life and, you know, he's the one causing me so much grief. And we focus on Satan as if he was the one in authority. Well, is that true? Is he the one in authority? In some small part, he is. But in the greater um, reality of things, God is the one in authority. And we learn that very quickly when we look at Job. I like the, the book of Job. And, you know, we can learn so much. We get such awesome insight in, in this book, in this experience of Job, which we don't get anywhere else in the Bible. And we see there in Job chapter 1 that, you know, the sons of God come before God. They, um, and also Satan comes there as well. And God has a conversation with Satan. Isn't that interesting? God, the, he has a conversation with Satan directly and asks him a few questions. Have you seen Job? And yeah, Satan answers back. And, you know, it's all awesome to see this conversation between God and, and Satan. And we learn something there. We learn an, an important fact. And yeah, Satan accuses Job and, and he says, yeah, it's not... Uh, you know, Job serves you for a reason because you've blessed him, you've helped him, you've given him so much. But take these things away and you'll see Job, he'll curse you and he'll turn away. And God says, all right, I give him into your power or his things into, his, into your power. And the Lord says to Satan, behold, all that he has is in your power only do not put forth your hand on him. And we know later on, God grants him the power over Job's body too. But, you know, it's God who is the one in authority. Very clearly we see there. There's no ambiguity. There's no grey area. There's no uncertainty there. It is God who is in control. Always. He is the one in, who is in authority over Satan, over this world, over you and I. That's where it matters, over my life. Is he the one who is in authority over my life? And what does that mean then? Well, it's not Satan who's controlling things in my life. He's not the one controlling circumstances in my life. He has some input, just as he did with Job. But it was God who gave the go-ahead. And it is always God who gives the go-ahead. Or he denies. So God is the one who's in authority. Always remember that. And I think perhaps sometimes we focus on Satan and we give him too much credit. And we focus on him and in focusing on him what happens? We become fearful. We become anxious. Because what is Satan? A deceiver. A liar. A lion who seeks to kill and destroy and to steal. So as long as our focus is on Satan and we give him credit for things going wrong in our lives, you know, fear will come, anxiety will come. Yeah. But I challenge you to see all these things as God is in control. It's not that God sends them. And God tempts no one. It tells us very clearly. It's not God who tempts us. It's not... God who, who comes and deals out these difficulties and trials in our lives. Satan is the, the messenger. He is the one who brings them. But God is in control. And we see in the life of Jesus such a wonderful example. What did Jesus face in his earthly life? Only comfort and ease? No, far from it. He was re, uh, rejected by men. He was spat upon. He was beaten. He had a crown of thorns placed on his head. When he goes to his hometown, they wanted to throw him off the cliff. So, what, what would Jesus have thought about these situations? Do you think Jesus ever thought, Ah, oh, that's Satan. I wish the Father would just get rid of him once and for all. 
You know what Jesus said when he was close to uh, going to the cross? He said, my heart is troubled. Um, And he says, what should I say then? Father, take me from this hour. Remove this cup from me. He says, no. It is for this that I came into the world. And he says, Father, glorify your name. Who was in charge at Gethsemane? Who was in charge at Golgotha? Satan or God? It was always God. God was always in control. And Jesus knew it. And he, had not, he, he did not fight against Satan. He never fought against Satan. Even when he was tempted in the wilderness. He used the word of God uh, to respond to Satan. And Satan went away. He was defeated. He knew Satan was you know, not in control. He wasn't the one over his life. And he says in John chapter 14, he says, the God of this world is coming because my hour has come. But it says, he says, he has nothing in me. And uh, these things are going to happen because I want to obey the Father. This is the will of the Father. So God, the Father, is in control. He always saw that. He never got, was never afraid of Satan. He was never worried or stressed because of what Satan might do to him. We can learn a lot from that, can't we? Let's not focus on what Satan's doing. Let's focus on God, in whose hand we are. And whether it's Rejoicing and good times and gladness that comes our way, give thanks to God. Whether it's calamity, whether it's sorrow, whether it's mourning, God has allowed it. He knows best. He knows why things happen like that. Let's learn to lean on Him. Let's learn to entrust ourselves into His hands. And it says about Jesus in 1 Peter chapter 3, That even while he was being reviled, even while he was suffering, he did not revile in return. He did not rebuke man in return. Why? Because he knew it's not man who's in control over him. It says he continued to entrust himself into the hands of the one who judges righteously. He always entrusted himself to the Father. So you and I also need to learn this as well. That we always have our focus on God, on the Lord, the one who holds us in his hand. And even in difficult times, even in uh, such you know, distress that we face sometimes, uh, let's learn to lean on him. Let's learn to entrust ourselves in his hands. Let's not focus on who's doing what to me, who's hurting me, who's uh, you know, treating me this way or that way. Let's say, God, you're in control. I trust in you. You have ultimate authority over every situation that comes into my life. Yeah, sometimes I stuff up and I I reap things because of what my decisions have been. I reap what I sow. As we've seen, even then, we can fall into his hands, who is a merciful God. But when others, others are inflicting us with something or afflicting us, or persecuting us, or whatever it might be, let's remember, don't focus on them. Don't focus on Satan. Focus on the Lord. Let Him be the one who guides us. Let Him be our strength. Let Him be our portion. And, you know, this one fact remains, that as long as we're alive on this earth, the tempter is going to come to tempt us. But... We know that God has the final word always. 1 Corinthians 10 tells us, God is faithful who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you're able. And so can we learn, you know, as, as we've seen from others, from David, can we learn from the example of Jesus? And Jesus on the cross, 
in Luke 23. I'll, I'll finish with this. Luke 23, verse 46. Jesus, when he was on the cross, about to breathe his last breath, what did Jesus say when he was there? Not a word of condemnation towards man. Not a word to Satan either. But a word to his father. And he says, crying out with a loud voice, he said, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. And having said this, he breathed his last. So let me ask you, let me challenge you, as this question has challenged me. Am I leaning on the everlasting arms? Am I leaning in his hand? Am I in his hand, the hand of Jesus? Am I his sheep? Am I following him? Am I making sure that my place is there in his hand? You know, by choice, I can depart from that place. God has given me the freedom if I so choose to. But, oh, may I learn to always stay there in the best place for me. The psalmist says, your nearness is my good. And my best place, my good, is in the palm of his hand, in his right hand. And that's where he chooses to hold me. Let's all seek that our lives might be in his hand. And may the Holy Spirit help us to see what a glorious thing that is. How good, how loving, how merciful our Father is. How he cares for us, how he holds us, how he strengthens us, how he has all authority in the heavens and on earth. And one day when he brings all this to an end, he is going to be the one who calls us into the joy of his kingdom, into the fullness of sonship through Christ. So let's stand and pray and give thanks to the Lord. You know, and... Maybe you have something to say to the Lord. Let's all pray together and maybe respond in some way, in some small way now, but may it be something on our hearts in, in the days to come where we remember these words of the Lord towards us, that nothing can snatch us from His hand. So let us be those who are willing and choose to be in His, his hand and to surrender all into His hand to trust in Him, to boast in Him, to allow Him to be the Lord in, in our lives. Let's all pray together.